Great. I think if I understood the texted command, that means that it is time uh, for me to get started. So um, thank you all for the chance to, um, to facilitate this, uh, this session for the Researcher to Reader conference. Um, and sincere apologies that it's not possible to um, join together in person. I think all of us um, would, would really um, like to have a chance to connect face-to-face -face on a session like this one. Um, and hopefully uh, it will be possible to do that again before too long. Um, Mark, thank you. Mark Carden, thank you for the heroic work you've done to, um, to organize this conference. I know, that, uh, I know that you've basically organized two or perhaps three conferences at the same time this, um, for this cycle, uh, given all the complex logistics. And so to you and the whole team, thank you for, for making this possible. Um, so um, we're here to talk about um, acquisitions and, and mergers. And uh, as, as, as so many of you will appreciate, the landscape uh, before us has seen a, a flurry of acquisitions in, in, in recent years. Um, every major publisher and many adjacent organizations um, have been either in acquisition mode um, or in startup mode. And the startups have, in many cases, uh, matured and been and been acquired. There's been a bevy of different kinds of portfolios that have been um, created, uh, in some cases fairly freshly over the last few years. And just to kind of check off the names of some of the companies that have been involved in these acquisitions, um, you'll, you'll all be familiar with these, but um, Digital Science, uh, Holt Springs Digital Science, Elsevier, EBSCO, Clarivate, Wiley, Sage, Taylor & Francis, et cetera, um, and even some of the not-for-profits have been involved in um, acquisitions or mergers. And so today we want to explore a little bit of this landscape, what's going on, how it operates, um, and we're just so privileged to have with us three um, ex well-experienced executives um, who will, um, will, will walk us through some of the, some of the major uh, issues before us. Um, let me introduce them um, by uh, alphabetical order through last names. Um, Andrew Preston, who, um, who founded Publons and um, eventually sold it to Clarivate um, and subsequently has been uh, involved as a founder of Cassini. Um, although uh, we will um, be speaking with Andrew on the, as a sort of representative of the buy side, the, excuse me, the sell side, the sell side in the sense of selling things uh, to companies, selling startups to companies. I do want to clarify that he's not currently affiliated with Clarivate in, in any way. Um, secondly, we have Martha Sedgwick, who is the Vice President for Product Innovation at Sage and a key architect of Sage's strategic investment uh, work, uh, for example, acquiring uh, Data Planet, Lean Library, and a number of other uh, very interesting, uh, interesting services and firms. Um, and then um, third is Todd Toller, who is the Vice President for Product Strategy and Partnerships at Wiley. Um, he is a key architect of Wiley's strategic investment strategy. Um, in recent years, that's included, for example, Hindawi, uh, J&J Editorial, and um, I believe most recently, Knowledge Unlatched. Um, and so you can see we have three very experienced um, executives with a great deal of um, of uh, perspective that they can um, that they'll be able to share with us. So um, let me get started. Our format today is going to be a facilitated discussion. I have a series of questions, and uh, each of these uh, each each of each of these individuals will um, will pop in um, as they like to uh, uh, to answer and discuss. So let's start by distinguishing between two um, two forms of acquisition. There's at least two basic forms of acquisition. One is sort of an investment portfolio model, uh, for example, in the way that a private equity firm might try to um, identify uh, uh, targets that can, um, that can grow financially. Um, and a second of, 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 of those um, is a strategic investment portfolio, which is much more common in, in our sector. But we have seen some exceptions. I think um, at one stage, digital science was uh, maybe a hybrid or even a little bit more of, of an investment rather than a strategic model. Um, so in, in your work, uh, I'll ask all three of you, um, can, can you uh, talk a little bit about how you found investment acquisitions and strategic acquisitions? Are those two fairly separate 
ways of thinking about either selling or buying a company or are they actually is there actually sort of a gray gray zone where they're they're on the same um, spectrum Martha, why don't I start with you? You look like you're looking for the unmute button. <laughs> yeah, I was. I was like, who, 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 who's going first? Um, I think. Um, I think w w when we look at the acquisitions, certainly the ones that I've been involved with um, at Sage, we we sort of see them as investments. You know, each one has been um, uh, made to move us into a new area of the business, and so through the acquisitions, we look to acquire new skills and experience. Um, internally and um and for businesses that also that through our investment uh we can sort of drive um additional you know we can accelerate their sort of growth trajectory so you know we've ex experimented with a number of pure investments you know um maybe one around the table here um and they've been sort of in highly strategic areas you know where we've been looking to learn something specifically but it, it those don't tend to be how we sort of focus in terms of strategic growth they don't feel quite right to us often investments i think are necessarily quite arm's length when it comes to sort of involvement in a in a business and the relationships you develop you often you, you know you, quite, you need quite deep pockets to build out your portfolio so you've got this sort of you know you expect most of the those investments to sort of you know those businesses to fail but some to really succeed and and um and i guess our pockets aren't quite so deep to uh, support that sort of range of risk that, that that you'd be looking for in with that sort of approach so you know i, I think what we uh, really value with with the sort of with the acquisition you know investment through acquisition um is uh is the relationships we build you know i, I was sort of saying about sort of bringing in expertise and experience you know it's we're looking to learn through doing it but also looking to sort of support those businesses through um our sort of brands and our endorsements support them in the market um with our existing sort of customer base and then maybe also through our operations so often you know depending on the size but the smaller businesses can really get um, a lot from things like just hr functions legal support finance that sort of thing as well and um so yeah but we the, the approach we've taken with technology from sage has been about bringing in smaller software services and um investing in them for that accelerated growth todd andrew yeah i'm happy to go next I, you know it's interesting this nomenclature that you know the sort of financial versus strategic we we don't use those kind of terms i mean we're never financial buyers at Wiley. We're always looking for something that can either accelerate a strategic direction that we're going in or that we can add value to. But I would say within that framework, there are two kinds of acquisitions. There's kind of the tuck-in ac acquisition, I'll call it a tuck-in because it looks so similar to what you're already doing that you can basically tuck it into an existing line of business and it provides growth and there's a strong you know sort of synergies rationale for doing that versus the transformative acquisition which for us would be something like knowledge unlatched which is not what we're doing now it's a direction that we're interested in moving perhaps elsewhere in the, val the value chain and you're using that kind of inorganic growth um, strategy of buying another company to get there faster than you could do it on your own so that's definitely like the framework that we that we would use that's really helpful. Thank you. I, I like that characterization, tuck in versus strategic. <clears throat> Makes a lot of sense to me. And I, to, to answer your like, um, like direct question, Roger, I do think that they are quite different things, a tuck in versus a strategic um, acquisition, particularly in terms of how you model things, like the, the story you put together for why this acquisition makes sense. Um, and by the way, that also kind of this applies to, in case anybody's interested, to the way you raise money for um, for a company as well as um, an acquisition. Something Martha did earlier. Um, but whichever whichever sort of thing you're doing, a strategic versus a tuck in, and exactly how you're modeling business, at the end of the day, it has to make financial sense. You know, there has to be some numbers at the bottom of the model. So there is that commonality between the two. Thank you. Um, so, so now I want to turn to um, to turning back to some of the really helpful ways that um, 
that, well, both Martha and Todd, that you sort of characterize the way you think about investments within the context of a port of a strategic portfolio or a strategic or a st corporate strategy. Um, in in a strategic portfolio, there's a there's necessarily a connection between corporate strategy, whatever that whatever that may be, um, uh, and um, and the acquisitions uh, approaches that that you might take. Um, that those should be interlinked. So. Can you walk us through, this is, I think, Andrew, this is more of a question for Martha and, and Todd, though happy for you to jump in as well, but um, how does corporate strategy guide acquisitions um, uh, or how much does sort of fortune or opportunism play a role? Hey, this thing is on the market, we should, we should snap it up. Like, can, can you talk to us a little bit both about how corporate strategy and how opportunism um, work within, within the context of, of this work? Should I go first this time? I, I, you know, that's actually one of the, 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 the key parts of the job is to try to be proactive and not wait around for the, the bankers to kind of shop the companies and then, you know, suddenly you're reacting to an investment prospectus that's on a formal timeline and then you're trying to decide as a company whether you want this or not. And that often will get you into kind of a bad position internally because um, you're making kind of a post hoc rationalization or trying to map it to a strategy. Um, so we try to do the opposite. We try to work a pipeline um, and basically identify what, what what our strategic drivers are, what would some inorganic growth opportunities look like, and then start profiling the companies in that space. And it's actually my job to to know all the people and the founders. You know, I know I've probably talked to Andrew. You know, every six months for ten years, like I know who all the, the founders are, and so that I can kind of tell what's going on. And even if it does go with a banker, like we're pretty ready for it. So that's that's definitely, um, that, you know, that's uh, that's the way way we think about it. But that you know, sometimes opportunistic, it just happens. It's like this is just oh wow, this is on the market. We we can't not look at this. Martha, do you want to jump in? Yeah, um, yeah. I I I I think a lot of what um, Todd says resonates with me. I think in terms of sort of what i think the strategy provides you with your framework with our framework so so but needs to be necessarily quite broad you can't be too prescriptive because you don't know what's going to be come up when and and um and so um so as an example like the our um move a couple of years ago into the sort of technology library services space was one that we wanted to do to sort of build on the um innovations we'd been um, investing in around sort of new content, new publishing for um, learning and research in a digital age. And um, and so a natural extension of that felt like moving into services that responded to sort of challenges we saw for our users in that space um, and looking for technology to sort of bring down those barriers. Um, but we and and we kept the sort of scope, scope we and we have to continue to keep the scope of that strategy fairly broad, you know, focus on sort of library services to support discovery and access and engagement with um, content. And within that, then there is room to play and to take the opportunities to build relationships and um, uh, and see which flowers bloom. You know, um, we we when we made the acquisition of Lean Library, we weren't looking necessarily specifically for an access broker solution, um, but through you know through speaking with Johan Tilstra, the, the founder of that. Um, business and um, you know building that relationship, understanding his business, him learning more about Sage and our values. You know, the um, seeing the opportunity, um, you know, for for um, that that could accelerate the growth of his business and bringing it into Sage just um, sort of flowed through from that. And so I think that's what, I, yeah, um, having that sort of strategy there, but broad, and then you know you're able to play within that space depending on what. Well, um, do that. Do a dance and see which um, which seeds flourish. <laughs> Todd, are you going to jump it's, in? Well, speaking of, it's funny because when Roger said portfolio earlier, and he kind of mapped it to the financial investment, but I think a portfolio investing quite differently. It's more like what the VCs would do, or I guess digital science, but certainly something like Blenheim, Chalcott would does, which is they're specifically working on problems that big companies can't solve for themselves. And they're planting lots of little seeds and pouring water on them all and hoping, um, you know, that, that, um, 
they get a couple of winners out of that strategy or they turn them over at a certain point in their growth trajectory to a bigger company or like with digital science, it seems like it's kind of turning into kind of a Clarivate style company and all these founders suddenly 10 years later have careers at digital science. But like, that's not something we do at all at portfolio investing. It's really hard to do that as a big company, a big public company, because you, it's really hard to prove the value of the portfolio on a quarterly basis to your investors, right? And that's, uh, it, that, that makes it, it makes it hard to buy like capabilities or very early stage companies when you're at a big company. Often you have to wait until they're big enough and turn into a real business to buy and buy them later. So that's something we're really always fighting against. Like, how do we come up with an investment framework that lets us, you know, get involved with companies earlier or take partial investments or take, you know, even a more strategic view than we've done historically? Well, I'll add one comment to this from the perspective of the sell side. You know, Todd mentioned having conversations over, you know, many years. I do think there is a component of fortune in all of this, which is that big company strategies change. You know, and something that makes sense now to a big company may not have made sense a year or two ago, and it may not make sense two years from now as well. And so I think there is a, a, definitely a component of fortune in, in this process of being acquired, a smaller company being acquired by a big company, a strategic acquisition, tuck in a separate, where um, there is this fortunate component of, component of timing, which may or may not line up. And um, I think is very clear when you're on on the sell side but maybe less so when you're on the buy side and you have your strategy and you're not waiting for anything you know you've got it um so 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 let me let me follow up on that just a bit if if i may um and i do think this this question is is for you andrew um can you can you talk a little bit in your experience about how some of the matchmaking here actually works so we sort of heard about it from uh, Todd, Todd and Martha sort of talked about it a little bit from the perspective of how they think about strategy and um, and acquisitions. But s many startups are founded with the idea of uh, of you know here's what a likely exit might look like, right? I mean that's that's not an uncommon thing for experienced founders to have have in mind. Can can you talk a little bit about how that can work and you know what the what the um, you know what the, the the sort of matchmaking process can can look like in in your experience i think there's probably two things there right there's the founding and the kind of the the goals behind that i guess speaking for my startups it's i mean you have to think about these things who might be an acquirer and that sort of thing who might be an investor etc but certainly for me at least the, the founding was all about a mission and trying to affect some change in the world uh, much more that than who might buy you at some point in the future. And in fact, that mission can then really does drive, you know, decisions you make about investment and subsequently acquisition. I think that's the guiding light for all of this. Just the first thing to say. I think second thing on matchmaking, I've not worked with a bank. We weighed it up, decided not to. Um, but for me, from, from what I can tell, and from what both Martha and Todd have mentioned as well, the relationships, the pre-existing relationships are key. You know, knowing the people um, in these different businesses, whether you're on the buy side or the sell side, um, and when these strategic alignments do come up, uh, finding out about them, because that's when the conversations can be had and you can, can come up with um, concepts and ideas that can, can start to make a lot of sense and get pretty exciting very quickly. So on the uh, not worked with a bank observation, um, we I, I would like to talk a little bit about um, pricing and um, bidding, if that's if that's a term that will that will resonate. So um, when Clarivate was announcing its acquisition of ProQuest uh, a year ago or so, um, the Clarivate CEO uh, claimed that they this is a quote don't do anything that is out for bid. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that 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 claim caught a number of of informed observers by surprise. Um, so can can you putting aside that particular claim for a moment? Um, can you share anything um, uh, you know from the perspective of the company being acquired? Is there any benefit to doing an exclusive? 
deal of only mm-hmm. talking to one possible acquirer or um you know how does how does that how does that work andrew well i don't think it's either or right typically through these processes there will be conversations with many potential acquirers um uh i guess early on they're just conversations later on there there's a bit more direction to them <clears throat> but at some point you're going to get to a stage where you need to sign some sort of term sheet and there's going to be some sort of exclusivity process there and so i think inevitably it does become exclusive at some point um whether you're going through a bank or otherwise um and i actually you know coming at this from a strategic perspective or, or a mission oriented perspective i think there are disadvantages for sure which are kind of obvious to everybody but i do think that exclusive period is is very important as it is an opportunity um and a necessary opportunity to develop that joint strategy for what the business will become within the larger company so um yeah that's how i said martha todd would you like to would you like to jump in on on any part of that at all are you sorry martha are you muted or are you sorry no. yeah i i was um i was um i i don't know i i think um i think that's right it you know it's sometimes you end up in a bidding situation sometimes you know there's all different routes through but the the challenge the what what's what can what can what is so great about not one of the things um is just that chance to continue to build that relationship and trust and sort of planning transition sort of planning and transitioning and really visioning together collect as a you know both or you know people in both organizations what that future will look like that you can do in just a, a different different level of conversation you know if you're in a if you're just in a one way but um but yeah so I have to I think that quote by Clarivate was kind of ridiculous so I I, I guess I, I being as sympathetic as possible it, what they must it must have been more like what I was saying is that they don't do deals that they're not already predetermined like they don't sit around waiting for something and try to react in real time from the bankers because it, it's just not fair to accept it expect, expect the seller not to try to get the best price in some kind of an auction process and personally from my point of view it's easier when there are bankers for the buyer on the buy side. The bankers do an incredibly good job of packaging up the investment and setting very realistic expectations with the seller. And I've only one time had a bidding war that the bankers successfully pulled off where I thought the seller got some kind of premium that was sort of architected by the bankers. That's usually not what happens. Usually the person who has the strongest case and the highest bid that's built on a lot of work ends up doing the deal. So I've done, we've done plenty of work, you know, directly with the sellers and it's usually their decision because they're saving money um, by not involving the bankers or, you know, they, they have a line of sight on where they might want to wind up. There, there must be some sort of game theory wrapped up in that Clarivate comment, right? Where if you approach a company and then they subsequently decide to go to bankers that, and put it out to bid, that can be a, um, you know, can slow things down, can increase the price, etc. So you can forestall that by having a position. Kind of makes sense to me. I guess if you're in, yeah, I don't know. Sometimes we'll do like investors use this term path to control. So you'll get it early with a company. This happens all the time. In fact, I think a lot of these digital science deals are structured like this, where, you know, there's an investment, there's taking the fairly small position in the company or but there's something in the contract with right up for first refusal like there's all these escalators in the deal that eventually puts you on a path to control and that's what unlocks that money from the buy side so that's that might also be what's behind that comment um and that maybe that's just the the, the only investment rationale but that's not the way all the targets are sold like a lot of times you know these companies decide on a very specific timeline when they're going to sell and they get, you know, it's a formal auction. So, um, so I have one more question and I understand we'll have um, at least one question from someone else in just a few minutes. We have about 10 or 10 or 12 more, more minutes uh, left to the, to the session. Um, so uh, folks um, either in the virtual audience or in person have, um, have questions to raise, um, get, get, get ready for those now. 
Um, I want to close by asking something that's a little bit less about um, the acquisitions themselves than really about the strategy of the acquirers. And I'll reveal perhaps something about my uh, my own perspective in saying this, but it seems to me that the publishers, the scholarly publishers, are becoming less like one another in recent years as we look at their as we look at their strategies. Um, certainly, if we look at the new portfolios that they're building, um, and without getting into you know every possible detail, we can see Elsevier pursuing one kind of strategy, Sage is pursuing another kind of strategy, Wiley another kind of strategy. Clarivate another strategy, et cetera. There's not to say there's no overlap, but they're distinctive from one another. Um, is that a fair characterization? Is is my first question? Like, am I reading too much into into the patterns the way that they look to me as an outsider? Um, and 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 if it's a fair characterization, how does that affect um, competition and bidding in the marketplace? Is it is it for 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 acquisitions? Is it sort of clear that well, actually, there's only one or two of these that would make make sense for a given startup, or um, or or how does that work? So, I'm, so I'm curious if you see this differentiation, and if so, what what some of the effects might might be? I'm happy to go. First. I guess I that's think, a loaded. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, that's. I think that's an astute observation. I, it's, it has to do with, you know, we were all in the same business at one point, selling books and journals to libraries. And now, you know, in this process of pivoting to services and software and maybe even content-enabled services, it kind of, by definition, starts to take you into different directions. And it, it's very interesting, though, that, you know, on any particular, like, transaction or acquisition, you're always trying to figure out who else the buyer is. And it's just not obviously, like, your, your competitors in the old journal business. Um, it's very clear that everyone's executing different playbooks. I think that's, uh, and there's all kinds of people from other industries that are getting involved in the kind of transactions that the, the publishing companies are angling for. So it's very interesting time. Certainly, I think when we moved to um, our journals to Atapon a few years ago, we weren't uh, we weren't imagining that there would be a future state where Wiley would have acquired Atapon, and so the, the world it feels like has changed, you know, changed quite a lot, you know, this landscape in in these newer areas for sure. And so, and I agree with that with what you're saying, Roger, and told, you know that that it feels that, that we're becoming more distinct in these new spaces. But our traditional businesses still are significant, you know, sizes and um and I think still compete in the in the same way. So I, I yeah, it's, it will be it'll certainly be really interesting to see how we keep evolving. Certainly as Sage, the 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 drive, the sort of fo focus around our innovation strategy has been around our sort of grounding in the social sciences, you know, you know, and our sort of networks and uh you know author networks editor networks in those spaces from our book and journal programs that's where our sort of published innovations in our publishing uh have moved and then the the technology building up from there and that does feel sort of quite distinctive for us but um yeah so this, this kind of divergence is is interesting it comes back to the the discussion about um you know fortune and you need strategic alignment between the buyer and the seller. And if everybody's doing kind of operating different strategies now, then I think that fortune component becomes a little bit more important, possibly, because you've got to find the right the right match. Um, but it is, I, I also think, in some sense, a little bit more of a dynamic marketplace than I'd thought a couple of years ago. And the, the most recent example of that is this H1 acquisition of um, of faculty opinions, which just happened the other day, you know, and I wouldn't necessarily have seen that coming, you know, two years ago, so. Thanks, thanks, thanks everyone. Um, and it's good to good to hear if the marketplace is staying dynamic. So that's, uh, that's, that's, uh, uh, that's reassuring, Andrew. Um, I, I understand that Stephen Pinfield will join us now to, uh, to ask a, a question of his own, Stephen? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, um, I'd like to ask uh, the panel members about their views on the consequences of all of this for the market as a whole um, and the system as a whole. Uh, you, there's a, a well-known um, tendency towards concentration in the publishing market 
at a sort of horizontal level with larger publishers acquiring smaller publishers. That's been happening for 30 years or more. And more recently, we've seen a more vertical integration, vertical concentration tendency with uh, publishers taking over workflow providers and other providers within the more general scholarly communication space. So my question is, um, do they see this as positive for the system as a whole, rather than just individual companies who are making those acquisitions? Um, and are there any negatives which they see, once again, for the system as a whole and for other actors in the system, rather than just the publishers concerned? And if there are negatives, how should they be addressed? I can go first there. <clears throat> um, case by case, right? And it, it, I think it varies by acquisition. But speaking to my own experience and being a, a having a mission led business where we were trying to affect some change in the world, um, I think it's incredibly positive this sort of opportunity because the only reason it happens is if um, you have a, an expectation that you can affect greater change as a result of the acquisition. And I think in our case, that certainly played out and for the better um, for the ecosystem as a whole. But that's just one case, you know, case by case basis. Thanks, Stephen. I, I think, um, you know, it's interesting. I think when Wiley, when big, the big publishers are buying the small publishers, the, the narrative is that the small independent publisher gets crushed. And now that the big publishers like Rogers that are doing different things, like for instance, you know, different views on how the future of research communications will, will look, we're still hearing that the small independent publisher is going to get crushed. Like that doesn't, that sort of meme or it doesn't disappear. But I, I, I actually agree with what Andrew said that I think it's, it feels less like consolidation to me right now, especially through m and It feels like there's a lot more options. The competitive landscape is changing extremely fast. And like, for instance, our pivot into like take J and J editorials. I'll just not to talk too much about what Wiley's doing, but you know, we used to sign, we used to buy content or acquire it off of societies and sell it in part of our big database. And now we're pivoting into these sort of standalone services that uh, independent publishers can pick and choose almost all the cart, like the kind of offerings we're doing. That's a pretty fundamental pivot away from trying to consolidate our sales power for subscription content. Like, so that's just one example where I think it's the dynamics working positively for the ecosystem. Yeah, it's, it's very hard to answer your question in like what in a, in a, in a, in a sort of with a pithy response. I feel like we could have another six hours um, thrashing it out and it would be fun to do that maybe at, at dinner <laughs> at another conference next year. But um, yeah, I hope the hope is that it, you know we continue to sort of invest in businesses. There is no shortage of sort of problems to be solved in the space. No shortage of startups emerging, and sort of and that this you know that us looking taking sort of different tacks, looking in different areas creates more opportunities. And um, certainly with the approach that we've taken with many of our the acquisitions into Sage, we have whether it's the businesses like Adam Matthew, Data Planet, the library, the, the intention is to bring the businesses in, but to preserve a level of sort of independence around their sort of governance, around their structure, their brands, their sort of organization, um, but to invest in their sort of growth, giving them a level of autonomy and the feedback um, from, from, you know, the, from the, from the founders and the businesses and the customers is very positive about those relationships that then can last, but um, with additional support to grow. But. I will. I will just say for myself that I think that there are some acquisitions that we've seen that could be seen to limit competition, and in some cases, um, build portfolios that could lead to certain kinds of services lock in. Um, there are others that, you know, as, as Todd describes Wiley's intention here, that could actually serve to increase competition. Um, there are yet others, and I, I would, I would call to mind, um, Clarivate's acquisition of ProQuest as an example, where I think you can look at the same acquisition through both lenses. And I think that one of the great, um, challenges certainly facing the library community and other critics of 
critics of consolidation is to, you know, develop the tools, the analytical uh, capacity and tools to understand whether an acquisition like that one ultimately consolidates power for Clarivate or provides more um, more uh, competition for, for example, Elsevier. And depending on which of those views you end up with, you can see an acquisition like that through quite quite a different lens. I know we only have two or three minutes left. I understand Anthony Watkinson has a, a quick question. And so Anthony, why don't you go ahead uh, Hello, very Roger. quickly now. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes. Um, yes. There's one big elephant, big elephant in the room, uh, which has not been mentioned at all. That's the word private equity. Mm. Uh, yeah. Uh, th sure. Thank you, Anthony. I think I think we had a little bit of a discussion about um, investment portfolios. But Andrew, do you want to say anything anything further about the role of venture capital or private equity in in this landscape? That that might be a nice way to end. I don't know that I could say too much. We weren't very heavily involved in in VC and, and private equity. I guess maybe the one thing to say about it is it's it's this is a challenging market to be in if you're interested in serious venture capital because it's you know in the scheme of things a small market. This is part of what makes it interesting. I I have a comment on that. I, I it's it's you know that to me like the VC and the private equity are starting to look very similar in the sense that they're both tend to be operating on very strategic playbooks. You just mentioned the H1 faculty opinions. Um, that's a lot of the same money behind ResearchGate. You know, like what, what's going on here? We, we started to see this with, uh, um, I mean, to clarify, these are very strategic companies, you know, that, so like what Roger was saying earlier about who who are the competitors, like, you know, it, certainly on the M&A front, I, I'm trying, you know, that's a big thing. Like what, it's not, in the old days, you thought of PE as coming in, cost cutting, um, taking money out of the business, trying to tr tr extract as much as like, it's, it's just not like that anymore. There's definitely something else going on, um, which I'm still trying to get my head around. So I'm glad you brought that up, Anthony. So it now um, falls to me to say a, a really deep thank you to Andrew, to Martha, to Todd for um, sharing so generously of your experience and expertise in these areas. This is such a dynamic Arena, there's so much more we could have talked about. Um, uh, Mark messaged me a moment ago to remind me that there's a whole set of questions after the acquisition is completed where we could talk about integration and some of the um, successes and limitations of, uh, of the post-acquisition dynamics. So perhaps that will be our panel uh, next time. Um, part two of the debate is uh, is about to take the stage. Um, Rick, Rick Anderson, I believe, will be facilitating that. Um, if you are online, I understand that you'll be going back uh, and uh, back to the timeline and selecting the debate. And uh, with that, I just want to uh, thank the panelists, thank the audience, and thank Mark for uh, for the chance to uh, uh, to have this panel today. Have a have, have a great rest of your conference. Thanks, Roger. Thank you. Bye bye.